And now, Marcel and I have the pleasure and the honor to call on stage Her Royal Highness, Princess Inara Aga Khan, Begum Aga Khan. She is a great philanthropist. She combines East and West. She is doing in projects, in social projects in India. She is the perfect one who gives the introduction to our next guest. Bravo, bravo. Ladies and gentlemen, I have known Professor Yunus for many years. Do you hear me? Yes? I have known you for many years, and he is my role model. More than that, he is my hero. So I am honored to have been asked to introduce him here, although Mohammed Yunus needs no introduction, whatever. His work as the founder of Grameen Bank is known to all. To date, thanks to the microloan system he pioneered, Grameen has helped 8 million of the world's poorest people, and the majority of them being women, lift themselves and their families out of poverty. His first loan was to a small group of 45 women. They were furniture makers in a small village in Bangladesh in 1976. $27 for the purchase of bamboo. None of the banks would have given money to the women because they were so poor. So they'd been dependent on a moneylender who charged them a shocking 10% interest per week. This kept the women at subsistence level and therefore dependent on the moneylender's extortionate rates. Professor Yunus's loan enabled those women to stand on their own feet to grow to prosper and to live a life in dignity. From $27 in 1976, Grameen's loan book is worth $9 billion today. The Grameen family of businesses And the Grameen family of businesses is active in 25 sectors, including food, textiles, IT, telecoms, energy. It is the role model for microloan initiatives all over the world, including, on a much more modest level, my own Princess Inara Foundation's work in Asia. As Barack Obama said when he presented him with the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom in August last year. Muhammad Yunus was just trying to help a village, but somehow he managed to change the world. The scale is global, the impact huge. And like so many of the new digital possibilities that we have heard about at this conference, the focus is personal, individual, human. Ladies and gentlemen, happily the world has acclaimed the achievements of Professor Yunus. He has honorary degrees from 38 universities. He is on the board of 45 companies and 66 advisory committees. He, in person or with Grameen, has received no fewer than 102 national and international awards and honors including the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. And in fact, he is the only banker to receive the Nobel Peace Prize and possibly the only banker who ever will. <laughs> You can't pick up a magazine without seeing him voted and quoted as one of the top 100 most influential people on the planet, or as one of the top 20 entrepreneurs of all time, or as one of the top 10 individuals that world governments should listen to. For me, personally, you are not top 100, nor top 20, nor top 10. For me, Mohammed Yunus is quite simply the most 
inspiring men I have ever met. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mohammed Yunus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After that introduction, it's very risky to sp speak. <laughs> then the real Yonos comes out. <laughs> All those <laughs> kind of descriptions about their words and so on. <clears throat> Thank you, Begum Khan. You are a true friend. And true friends are always exaggerate. <laughs> Uh, I'll be quickly covering some aspects of our work uh, because I thought it's relevant. And uh, we'll just mention that we began very modestly in one village and gradually grew over time. Right now, within Bangladesh, we have over 8 million borrowers, 97% women. And we lend out over $100 million a month, loans averaging under $200. Repayment rate, 98%, 99%. And the bank is owned by the borrowers. So bank makes profit. Profit goes back to them as a dividend. So they are good. We also encourage their children to go to school. And as the, these are all illiterate women who, the first generation who are the borrowers of Grameen Bank. But we wanted to see that the, the the cycle of poverty doesn't continue the same way over and over again. We wanted to break the cycle. So one of the things that we wanted to do, let the children go to school. And they, we have succeeded in having all the children in school. And then we see they are moving into higher education. So we introduce higher education loans so that they don't have to worry whether parents can support the higher education. Right now, we have more than 48,000 students in medical schools, engineering schools, universities. And each month, more and more students are getting into higher education with higher education loans. So we wanted to see a whole new generation coming out of it. One of the questions they ask when I meet them, talk to them, how do we find jobs? So difficult to find jobs in Bangladesh. So hearing it many, many times, I started telling them completely different thing said to forget about jobs, you start think differently. And you should not be worrying about the way other kids worry about. Said you should make it a personal pledge. And you repeat it every morning when you get up. I shall never seek job from anybody. I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job giver. That's my mission. And that way, you start thinking completely differently. Because otherwise, you go to the routine, get a good grade, get a good degree, get a good job. And that's not the whole world is about. World is about yourself, the person. And we say your mother owns a bank. So why are you worrying about a job? Your problem should be how to use this money that the bank has so that you lift yourself from whatever condition you are and lift your whole family and lift the whole community and the whole nation. So it's the creativity of the person which makes all the difference, not the certificate that you bring from your university. So go for that. So now many of the children they're coming to take loans from Grameen Bank to start business alongside their education. Said, so you don't have to wait for the final certificate. You need the certificate for jobs, but for your own em employment of yourself, you don't, you don't need a certificate. And along the way, we saw the power of technology, how powerful this new information technology is bringing in. 
And I got very excited seeing that power and say how this power to be used for the benefit of the poor people and the poor women. When Bangladesh government wanted to give license in mid 90s to set up private telephone companies. Before that, it was all state-run telephone companies. For the first time in Bangladesh, they're saying they will give license to private companies to operate telephone companies. We thought about it. We said, why not? Let's apply for one. See, find out. We applied, and the government officials say, hey, you lend money to the poor people. Why do you need this license for telephone company? I explained to them, I said, our idea is to bring this telephone in the villages where telephone doesn't exist. And then to put this telephone in the hands of a poor woman. They said, what does she do with it? Who is she going to call? I said, no, she's not going to call anybody. She will set up a business of her own, let, renting out this telephone to anybody who'd like to make a call, and she'll make money. Everybody thought it was a crazy idea. But finally, we persuaded the government and got the license. And now we called it Grameen Phone. Today, it's the largest telephone company in the country. We have about 25 billion subscribers. We have 50% of the market share. So Bangladesh has 50 million telephone subscribers, and it's growing very fast. And to do, in the process, what we did, we started our work in 1997. And we gave loans to the poor women to buy herself a cell phone and start the business of selling the service of the cell phone in the village. It became a roaring business. And if you have a cell phone in your hand, that was the quickest way to get out of poverty because you made so much money by just renting it out. And soon we have 400,000 telephone ladies all over Bangladesh. And that lifted the awareness of telephone in the whole village. And this is one of the reasons why telephone now moved all over Bangladesh, every single corner of Bangladesh. And poor, the telephone ladies who are making such a big business, their business disappeared. Because everybody has a phone now. Who needs to go to the telephone lady to make a phone call? We said, don't worry. We'll find a new business for you. We said, the telephone ladies will now become the internet ladies. <laughs> because these telephones are all internet enabled telephones. So it's a question of just getting used to this. Everybody said women will not, these poor women will not understand how to operate telephone. But soon she showed, she became such an expert on these cell phones that almost people started thinking maybe she was born with a telephone in her hand. She knows everything about it. So I said, don't worry about internet e either. They will figure it out if it brings money. Right away, she will go for it. So impossible is not the subject that we should be chasing. It's imp there is nothing called impossible. So if you want to expand things, if you want to reach out, is a technology, a power of technology can overcome everything. The, today, the businesses own all the technology. And they are directing this technology to chase money for themselves, profit maximization. I said, that's where we went wrong in our conceptualization of the economy itself. And that's why we create financial crisis all the time. This is not the only time, but this is a big one. But we keep on creating this financial crisis. Because our whole economy is designed with the assumption that human beings are born here to chase profit. The, the narrow interpretation of human being in designing the architecture of economic theory created this problem. I said, human beings are not single dimensional beings. We are not money making machines. Human beings are multi dimensional beings. So other dimensions are completely forgotten in the architecture of economics. I said, take, for example, one dimension which are selfishness. And that is the element that was built, that was taken and used to build the whole architecture of business. I said, what about the selflessness in us? All human beings are also selfless beings. They are not allowed inside the economics. I said, why not? Isn't it a subject of human being or a subject of a kind of tourniqueted human being, a partial human being? As we say, it's a subject of full human being. You have to accept that selflessness inside of it. So I started the idea that 
businesses should be built also on selflessness. If people like to enter into that business, let them do it. Who, who, should you, who are we to stop them? It will be a selfless business. The selfish business is all about me. Everything has to come to me. And selfless business is about others, nothing for me. And people say, no, this is not the way business works. I said, that's the way business should be working if you allow them to, allow them to, allow them to chance. So I started creating those companies. And many of those companies now are very popular, like Grameen Danone is a joint venture with Danone, it's a social business to bring nutrition among the children of Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a big problem of malnutrition among the children. 50% of the children of Bangladesh are malnourished. And most of them are severely malnourished. So what we did, we put all the micronutrients which are missing in the children, vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, into this yogurt and make it very cheap so that the young, the poor children can afford it. If a child eats two cups of this yogurt every week, within eight to nine months, the child regains all the micronutrients which are missing and becomes a healthy child, playful child. And this is a social business because we, both of us, Grameen and Danone, agreed right from the beginning, we'll never take any dividend out of this company. We can take back our investment money, nothing more than that. The whole purpose of the company is to address the malnutrition of the children and it's doing very well. Children love the yogurt, and the company is making, re recovering all the costs. Now we are expanding our business. Danone is happy, we are happy, because when we see children moving out of malnutrition, that's the greatest happiness anybody ever get. get. So I said, put this as an idea. And many other companies are coming. We have joint venture with Veolia, water company from France, to solve the problem of drinking water in Bangladesh as a social business. This is not for making money. This is to solve the problem. Seeing this again and again, I'm totally convinced every single problem in the world can be addressed in a social business way. While the profit-maximizing business will not think about using the business to change, to solve a problem, because that's not their mandate. Their mandate for the shareholders to bring maximum return. So they are glued to that objective. I said, why don't we create social business to use that power of that technology to address the problems of the world? And that's the connectivity we need. And then, with the power of the information technology, it can just blow away everybody. We are now moving into healthcare. Dan Grameen Danone is a healthcare issue. Grameen Beulah is a healthcare issue, water. And also, we are doing with the Adidas, the shoe company. The, challenge that we gave to Adidas that as to adopt a mission that nobody in the world should go without shoes. As a shoe company, this is our responsibility to make sure we produce shoes affordable to even the poorest person. So they like that. So out of that, we created a social business to produce shoes very cheap, affordable to the poorest person. And this year, they will be marketing these shoes. They are in, in the process now. And this is not for comfort of the foot. It is for, again, it's health intervention because many of the diseases get into the body to the skin of your feet, particularly parasitic diseases. Hookworm is a major disease in the world. If we can only cover our shoes from right from the beginning, we would have saved many of the children from this terrible disease and which causes malnutrition and other diseases. So what we're doing now to bring healthcare as a social business in the villages of Bangladesh. And there we are creating what we call health management center, where the focus of the management center is to keep healthy people healthy. So the prevention becomes our major goal. Early treatment becomes early detection and early treatment. That's our second goal. In that, what we're doing, we are trying to redesign the diagnostic equipments because today's diagnostic equipments are very impressive, very complicated, very sophisticated, so that the patients are impressed that the money we pay to the hospital is worth it. Actual thing can be done in a very simple shoebox fashion with one button operation. And I give the example of digital camera. I said, look at the traditional camera with so many gadgets in it. 
and still you have difficult time to take a good picture. With the digital camera, no matter what, you press it, you get it, every telephone has it, you don't miss it. I said, why can't we do the diagnostic tools like that? So we are happy that some of the diagnostic tool manufacturers are collaborating with us. General Electric Healthcare is one of them. So we are making these simple diagnostic tools and telling them this should be, inter this should be mobile phone uh, friendly gadget. So when we have ultrasono, little gadget, portable, simple, we take to the women house by house. I said, Peep, women don't have to come to the clinic. This is a lesson we learned from Grameen Bank. Our first principle of Grameen Bank was people should not come to the bank. Bank should go to the people. So we are trying to same idea in healthcare. The patients or persons don't have to come to the clinic. They should go house by house treating them. So we take this portable little machine, little equipment, and do the ultrasono for the pregnant mothers and plug it into the mobile phone. Images go to the wherever the doctor, the specialists live, because specialists don't want to come to the villages or the small towns. They want to live in the capital city. So healthcare never gets out of the health capital city. So here you have solved the problem of the doctor-patient distance disappear because the technology solves that problem. You can watch it on the screen, your beautiful chamber, you watch it, see it, and pick up the phone, talk to the patient, talk to the mother, and the one who is serving this, instruct her to do this if you have any problem, call me back. So intimacy of the relationship between the doctor and the patient is still retained, but the distance is forgotten, distance is done. We can redesign the whole healthcare system in an affordable way so that it becomes a social business rather than money-making business because that's where we lost all the people. In many, many countries, including Bangladesh, has a serious problem where bulk of the population do not get healthcare from the state-run healthcare system because it's inefficient, corrupt. They do not get healthcare from the uh, private sector because they are too busy making money at the top. They don't want to go at the bottom. So I said, that's a space for social business. We can do that. In a way, it runs as a business. It's a non-loss, non-dividend company and can solve everything. And in a, in a social business, all you need to do is to design the concept of it, how to make it happen for five people or 10 people. If you know how to do it for 10 people, all you have to do now is to replicate it 1,000 times and million times, you have all the people covered. So it's not the size of the operation, which is, is the impressive part of it, it's the design of the pro program. And, uh, Begum Aga Khan mentioned that we started with $27 in one village. With $27, there's no news in that. Oh, but who cares, $27? But what it did, it defied all the rules of the conventional banking and created a system in one village. Today, it's a global phenomenon. Everywhere you go, you hear about Jamin Bank, microcredit, and microfinance, and all that. So this is what it is. If you want to expand the reach of the internet and the, uh, and the uh, uh, t t telecommunication, uh, Facebook, and other social networking. One of the things we have to remember, if you can plug in the social objectives into it in a business way, you don't have to wait. It will run like a wildfire. The fact that telephone that we gave to the poor women worked because her interest was in included into it and it is spread like anything. When people saw the benefit of that tool, they started saying, can I buy one for myself? And company started reducing the prices and it's going everywhere because his mobile phone can reach out to anybody. Today, mobile phone is the future. You can bring everything into it. Healthcare, I just mentioned one use of that healthcare. There are diverse uses of healthcare with mobile phone. And many of the things that we are talking about, laptops, $100 laptop, or another cheaper laptops, and so on, probably will disappear because of the power of the mobile phone. Mobile phone will not only remain a communication device to talk with the voice communication, it will become really the transmitter and receiver of all the messages. You plug in the screens, it becomes a tele. You plug in this, it becomes something else. This is simple thing which lets you do that. If you want to use it for healthcare, you get all those. You want to do it education, you get that. You want to do it for business, you get that. You want to do it for remittances, banking, you get that. That's a little thing. 
But you have to remember the economics of it. People don't buy things just for fashion or for personal use, like iPod is a personal use. But if you want to go in a big way, it has to be used for daily life. It's a life-related activity for them. One of the things I said, I mentioned iPod, I said, look at the technology of iPod. If you, if you can use this technology, just this simple technology that exists today for eliminating illiteracy in the whole world, this becomes the, your school, your friend, your guide, the poor illiterate woman in Bangladesh playing with the eye education kind of iPod, learning how to read, how to spell, how to talk, how to communicate, all in this, just, but just, by touch, just by touching, nothing else. She doesn't have to read anything. That becomes the most powerful tool. Children will be learning languages with that little thing because they will have their friends in their uh, Facebook or something or different languages. Children learn languages very quick, but just, but just, just by listening to each other. That's why when your five-year-old, three-year-old goes to a school in a different country, he or she picks up the local language. Nobody can speak in the family or anybody else, but he speaks fluent local language. And he forgets speaking in your language because he's so comfortable with the language his friends are speaking in the, in the school. This is his school. Make that his school. He will learn any language in the world. Just give him a chance. So it's a question of what we want to do with this technology. And if you forget, uh, and we must forget, there's nothing called impossible in this business. It's all question of creativity, all question of commitment, and all problems can be resolved. Thank you very much.